Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. It was a warm October evening in Dublin, and the pubs of the city center were busy. Henry Coughlin was confident as he cruised O'Connell Street, looking for men interested in a casual sexual encounter. He stepped down into an O'Connell Street lavatory, and a man inside made eyes at him. He made eyes back. There were plenty of empty stalls in the lav, but Coughlin didn't use one. Instead, he walked in and walked back out, brushing by the man with whom he'd made eye contact. Coughlin went and stood in front of a nearby building under construction, seemingly admiring it. The man from the lav came and stood beside him. That's a fine building they're putting up, the man from the lav said. I believe it's going to be a hotel like the Gresham. Coughlin, who knew better, said he'd heard it would be shops on the bottom, so not like the Gresham. Noticing the time, Coughlin told the man from the lav that he had an appointment to keep, so he had to be off. The man said he'd walk with Coughlin, since he was heading in the direction of O'Connell Bridge as well. When they got to Abbey Street, the man from the lab invited Coughlin in to Mooney's, a pub nearby, for a drink. Coughlin said he couldn't, as he had an appointment at six. The man from the lab asked if they might meet up later that evening. Coughlin said he couldn't tonight, but that they could meet any other night. The man from the lab said he was going out of town, but that they could meet in a week's time, perhaps at Mooney's pub. Coughlin laughed and said no, because if you turned up and I didn't, or I turned up and you didn't, it'd only be a case of a man drinking on his own, and what a lonely thing that would be. When the man from the lab suggested the very spot in which they stood, Coughlin said yes, and that would do nicely. They planned to meet again on October 11th at 7 p.m. in this spot at the corner of Abbey and O'Connell. When Coughlin offered his hand, the man from the lav grasped it and gave a squeeze, saying, I hope there will be something doing. Coughlin only smiled and said coyly, you will have to wait and see. The man from the lav headed off to the pub and Coughlin continued on his way to the Garda station. When he told his superior, Ennis, about his encounter with the man from the lav, Ennis gave him special instructions to meet as arranged on October 11th. Coughlin had baited the trap and was to secure evidence to prosecute the unsuspecting man from the lav for an act of gross indecency. The Irish police, or Garda, had a multitude of tactics for catching men having sex with men. One of the most controversial was when they used agence provocateur, men who used their own bodies as bait for same-sex desiring men. Today, a defense lawyer would undoubtedly use the guard's own testimony to argue that this was entrapment. We'll finish the story of Coughlin and the man in the lav later in this episode, but you can imagine where this is going. When I first wrote about this story in my doctoral dissertation, I was warned away from calling this and similar cases entrapment, because entrapment is illegal. I didn't dig deeper at the time because I just wanted to graduate. (laughs) 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 Guilty. Um, Today, I finally want to unpack this case and place it in the longer history of the agence provocateur, entrapment, and the role of authorized crime in modern policing. I'm Avril Earls. And I'm Susie B. Wilson. No, not really. I'm Sarah Hanley Cousins. (laughs) We are your historians for this episode of Dig. We have some truly generous listeners. We want to thank all of our patron supporters. We are so honored to have listeners all over the world, a global community that is reflected in our incredible auger and excavator level patrons, Lauren and Edward in Ohio, Denise in Albany, Maddie in Texas, Maggie in Oregon, Danielle in Idaho, Lisa in British Columbia, Agnes in Iceland, Iris in Washington, Maria in Germany, and Colin, Susan, and Peggy right here with us in Buffalo. Thank you so much from the bottom of our historian hearts. Listeners, if you are not yet a patron of the show, it's really easy. Check us out at patreon.com slash digpodcast to learn more. Though they may seem like timeless institutions, the centralized police as we know them are a fairly modern invention. 
The French were among the first Europeans to establish a municipal and uniformed police force to keep an eye on the rabble of Paris in 1667. In the American colonies, local patrol units were created to hunt and capture escaped enslaved people in the 1700s. The modern, publicly funded organizations as we know them today were created in the 19th century to enforce law and order and, of course, deal with the criminals who disrupted law and order. Home Secretary of the United Kingdom, Sir Robert Peel, established a police force in Dublin in 1822 to help maintain order in Ireland, where resistance to the 1801 Act of Union was ever-present. When Irish Catholic lawyer and political hopeful Daniel O'Connell created the Catholic Association, a mass movement with thousands of Irish members, to pressure the British government to repeal the penal laws that disenfranchised Catholics, the British expanded the presence of the Royal Irish Constabulary throughout Ireland to deal with agrarian unrest in O'Connell's famous monster meetings. Peel quickly saw the usefulness of a centralized municipal police force and created one for London in 1829. Following the British example, Boston and New York City soon after created their own police organizations in the 1830s and 40s. The charge of these early policing organizations was as one might expect, walking the streets of cities, towns, and villages to maintain the peace, dealing with reported crimes, and apprehending criminals. For most of the 19th century, there was little in the way of organized investigative police work, or the collection of evidence and production of information to be utilized in a prosecution effort. Scholars of policing describe the period of 1800 to 1880 as one in which investigative policing began with individual detectives. According to Brendan Murphy, as policing organizations grew and bureaucratized, they established specialized branches dedicating to investigative policing. This reform and growth period stretched from around the 1880s to the 1930s, a significant point in time for the fledgling Garda of independent Ireland, as we will discuss in a bit. With access to greater and more efficacious technologies like fingerprinting, databases of criminal records, procedural crime scene investigation, but also really simple things like radios, telephones, flashlights, cars, and motorcycles, the process of investigation itself became further specialized. According to Murphy, quote, essentially the investigation of crime has moved away from individual actions of a heroic detective and become professionalized, corporatized, and heavily reliant on technology and information systems. That's even more true in the current age, you know, our own contemporary age of policing with the role of things like trace DNA, globally accessible databases, and the potential for multi-agency information sharing. Investigative police work can be and is ever evolving with bureaucracy and oversight generally matching pace with the technological changes. That said, as Murphy and other scholars know, one of the most effective methods of investigative police work is still undercover operations. According to Murphy, crimes involving willing or mutually implicated parties such as white collar crimes, corruption, consensual sex offenses and drug trafficking are normally conducted in secret and accordingly specific methodologies have evolved in order to investigate them. These methodologies are often undercover and typically involve deception. From plainclothes detectives cruising in unmarked cars to deep undercover agents planted in criminal organizations, the intelligence gathering potential of what Murphy terms authorized deception and authorized crime are as essential to sussing out criminal activity today as they were in 1927. And yet, as in the case of Henry Coughlin and the man from the lab, this line of policing comes with a set of ethical and legal problems that one cannot ignore. Authorized deception and authorized crime, as Brendan Murphy describes them, are ideas that I want to just unpack for a second. These are not concepts that are unique to the U.S., obviously. From its inception, the Garda, for example, used clandestine surveillance and undercover officers to gather intelligence and arrest people who broke the law. In the United Kingdom as well, starting in the 1960s, covert policing was integrated into regular police functions and continued well into the 21st century. Authorized deception has long been a normalized part of police work, as it is, a, you know, is statecraft. After all, espionage is not a modern invention by any means. But as one might imagine, the normalization of such tactics can take a toll on individual officers and also cast aspersions on the legitimacy of the evidence collected in the course of the deception. 
In 2010, for example, there was a scandal in the UK when when it was revealed that undercover officers had infiltrated the environmentalist groups that protested the 2009 G8 summit, some going so far as to marry or father children with women members of the activist group. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, under their false identities and pretenses. Wow. One of the officers sued the London Met um, for being mishandled by his supervisor. That undercover agent, Mark Kennedy, told The Guardian, quote, I worked undercover for eight years. My superiors knew who I was sleeping with, but chose to turn a blind eye because I was getting such valuable information. They did nothing to prevent me from falling in love. Oh, my. That's complicated. (laughs) Obviously, his wife divorced him yeah I after she understand. found out who he was <laughs> i can understand why <laughs> yeah policing scholar gary marks notes the same problems in the american system of authorized deception and particularly the toll of undercover work on officers one famous example is john livingstone an fbi undercover agent who was lauded for his successful investigative operation in the years after though it was revealed that he struggled to separate from his false identity as a distributor of sexually explicit material in miami and continued to use his undercover identity without authorization until he was arrested for shoplifting. The danger inherent in undercover work today has long-term effects on many officers doing that work. Many get addicted to drugs like cocaine and alcohol and have relationships that end messily, even sometimes violently. Authorized crime has also become a standard element of modern policing. A civilian, for example, is never permitted to break down a door and subdue through force the occupants of a residence. For civilians, those acts are crimes, breaking and entering, assault, battery, perhaps even attempted murder. With a, with a search warrant issued by the state via a judge, these actions are still crimes, but police are authorized to commit them. As investigative policing has grown and becomes institutionalized, the processes by which police are authorized to break laws in order to enforce other laws have expanded in the last 100 years. In the U.S., we have normalized this so much that we often perceive police as above the law, in the sense that they are often granted temporary authorization to break the laws that govern civilians. They are. Today, in the U.S., Canada, Britain, and Ireland, police can enter residences, apprehend suspects, seize, quote-unquote, evidence, and more, without a search warrant, too. According to the Ontario government website, for example, police are authorized to enter a private residence without a search warrant if they need to enter in order to prevent someone inside from being seriously injured or killed, or there is evidence in your home that relates to a serious offense that they need to find that and they need to find the evidence right away or it might be lost or destroyed. They have reasonable grounds to believe that there is evidence in your home, for example, drugs or weapons, and they need to act immediately so the evidence will not be destroyed or lost to give emergency aid to someone inside, to protect the life or safety of someone inside if they have reasonable belief that a life-threatening emergency exists, to protect the life or safety of people in the home if someone heard a gunshot inside, to prevent something that might be about to happen, if they have reasonable belief that their entry is necessary in order to stop it, to investigate a 911 telephone call, obviously, to help someone who has reported a domestic assault, to protect people from injury if the police have reason to suspect that there's a drug laboratory in the house, or to help animals in immediate distress because of injury, illness, abuse, or neglect. Right. Yep. That's a heck of a list. And it's a list that's easily manipulated to fit the actual circumstances that the police want, right? Yes. It's easy to say, but there was a cat inside that was in danger. (laughs) (laughs) Similar caveats and loopholes exist for the U.S., U.K., and Irish police. In Ireland, many laws give Garda leeway to enter premises without a warrant. For example, the Intoxicating Liquor Acts, um, which were first passed in 1927, and then there was amendments in 1943, 1960, 1962, and many others. The Public Dance Halls Act of 1935, the Health Acts, uh, of which there have been dozens passed between 1878 and today, they all um, can be used as excuses to enter premises without a warrant. Other legislation entitles police officers to search you and or your vehicle without a warrant. For example, the Dublin Police Act of 1840, 
1942, the Misuse of Drugs Act of 1977, and the Criminal Law Act, which was passed by the UK Parliament first in 1828 and then amended dozens of times under British and then independent Irish rule. As suggested in the Irish statute, officers are authorized to use, quote unquote, reasonable force as well. Activities that would likely be categorized as destruction of property or vandalism for a civilian. In the United States, we have authorized the use of force, including lethal force when necessary. When necessary has been loosely defined in the U.S. as evidenced by the all too regular police killing of unarmed suspects and those held in police custody, something which happens with depressing regularity here in Buffalo. When officers kill suspects and civilians, they may be issued suspensions or even lose their jobs. But the policing culture and criminal justice system rarely prosecutes those officers for murder or even for manslaughter. Civilians who accidentally kill someone when defending themselves are still tried. Like soldiers in war, though, American police are exempted from those processes. Significantly, I think this is not the case everywhere. In Ireland, where police brutality is rarer but not unknown, certainly, the Guardi are not given such free license to abuse civilians as they are in the U.S. In 2011, for example, several Guardi were charged and found guilty for assaulting a man in Waterford. The man had been resisting arrest after drunkenly urinating in the street. The Guardi were caught on CCTV, um, knocking him to the ground and punching him several times. Three officers who did the brutalizing were convicted. Now, if we were to talk about, you know, Northern Ireland during the era of the, tr- era of the Troubles, that would be an entirely different story and harkens back to the issue of the framing of the relationship between police and civilians. Um, in the North between 1968 and 1998, the police were treated like an army at war with the provisional IRA and its offshoots, these civilians. And to be fair, IRA members killed, tortured and set off bombs because they also believed that they were in a war for independence. When officers commit unauthorized crimes, there are instances in which their status and occupation protect them from legal ramifications. There are cover-ups in every policing organization around the world. Sometimes this is facilitated by broader police and government corruption. In the U.S., this is facilitated by an informal code of loyalty to one's fellow officers above all else, a phenomenon that is often known as the blue wall of silence. Police corruption is as old as the organization itself and never without criticism, pushback or calls for reform. There are there are still regulatory rules and procedures that govern the when and how authorized crime can be committed. Though we in the U.S. often perceive police to be above the law, there are limits to police power. An on-duty uniformed police officer cannot drive their police cruiser down the Florida State Highway at 150 miles per hour. Unless they are in pursuit of a suspect, of course. Yeah. But yeah. But unless they have their lights on. Yes. Right. That, right. That's something that uh, is also easily you, mm, yes. manipulated, right? Manipul- like, yes. Everybody in any small town has probably known, like, you know, the even the the volunteer fire department guys who put what my dad always called the Kojak light up on their truck so that they can speed and run red lights and stuff like that, because it looks like they're in pursuit. Exactly. But as one study of arrest reports for U.S. police between 2005 and 2011 shows, officers are not always above the law. That study identified 6,724 arrested officers in that six-year period, with 1,475 arrests for sex-related police crime, over half of which involved sexual abuse of children. Oh, my God. 1,405 arrests involving alcohol-related police crime, 739 drug-related, 3,328 violence-related, and 1,592 profit-motivated crimes. Notably, these were just the crimes that made it to news reporting agencies. The authors of the study suggest that most of these crimes were opportunistic and facilitated by the nature of police work, which involves heavy interactions with civilians and sort of temptations for um, criminal activity. I'm actually really surprised that the smallest number of each of those things is drug related. Is drug related, yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm surprised that that's not the biggest one. Just because it's easy. I mean, not easy, but you know what I mean? Just because it's the easiest thing for 
poli- they they have unparalleled access to illicit drugs and you know yes they can steal them away and sell them or use them or whatever right well i think that again um as this this report noted these are just the crimes that made it to the news so there right. might be other um officers who were arrested and convicted but that the then the courts um sort of protected their identities mm-hmm. and sealed when the they records and stuff, sealed the yeah. records and stuff um because if they're sent to prison then they're probably more susceptible to True. you know mm-hmm. death and murder in inside the prison if it's known that they're they're police um and also i think that drugs might be one of and this is just a hypothesis and i have no evidence to back this up but i'm going to guess that drugs have one of the higher likelihoods of being covered up right yeah. i think that people are more likely to overlook drug abuse and addiction mm-hmm. than they would just then say like um domestic violence mm-hmm. or child abuse yeah yeah um to some extent yeah maybe more easily hidden too mm-hmm In theory, an officer who is off-duty would not be authorized to subdue suspects or break into someone's private residence. This is challenging to uphold, though, as in many states and countries, the court systems support the legal claim that a police officer is always on duty. So when police activities can be framed as meeting the basic criteria, like those we just listed, for things like entering private residences or searching your person or your vehicle without a warrant, they can be exempted from what few limitations do exist. It's even more challenging to track the difference between off and on duty for undercover police work. Well, presumably there is a record keeping system that determines times and days when an undercover officer is on or off duty and undercover officers must report to senior officers regularly and file reports and contribute in some way to the normal operations of the department. Marks, uh, Gary Marks, the scholar of policing notes that officers who go deep undercover can sometimes lose themselves in the work. The psychological toll of building a relationship with a suspected criminal and then betraying that trust, even if it was built on false pretenses, can be immense. (laughs) I was just thinking of Brooklyn Nine-Nine and all of the like when they go on deep undercover and how like crazy they get. <laughs> mm-hmm. The shenanigans. Understanding the challenges and value of authorized crime and authorized deception and policing is further complicated when those tactics are employed to police moral crimes. Sex work and its related activities like brothel management, pimping, soliciting in public places, etc., in particular, continued to be policed throughout the U.S., U.K., Ireland, and elsewhere. While the exchange of money for sex is technically legal in the U.K., the associated activities are not. In the U.S., prostitution of any kind is illegal except in Nevada, which permits brothel-based sex work. It's also illegal in Ireland, though one of the best buddy cop movies of all time, The Guard, has a long subplot about an Irish guardie who spends one night every month with women from a sex work service. If I remember correctly, and I didn't look this up, so this is just fully off, you know, I've watched this movie like a thousand times from my memory, (laughs) which may be false. They come in on a bus, I think from either Galway or maybe Dublin, and they're not Irish women. I think they're probably Eastern European, so I think it's supposed to be like a commentary on immigration in Ireland. Um, Stack the line side like prudery and the old Irish belief that prostitution doesn't even exist in Ireland, which is, ha, of course, laughable as anywhere prostitution is now and has always been in independent Ireland, just as it was in Ireland when Ireland was part of the UK and before the Act of Union. Sex work is ubiquitous and everywhere all the time. In any criminal situation, an agent's provocateur might have ethical qualms about his role in eliciting others to commit crimes. A simple transaction, like getting a drug dealer to sell you an illegal substance, might not carry much in the way of an ethical burden. But what if you were instructed to create a fake supply chain and gave the drugs to that dealer to then distribute? Officers who have gone deep undercover may form attachments to the people they work with, which creates one level of emotional and psychological challenge. Others may find the simple act of being the supplier, even if it is an authorized crime, morally compromising. Some may lack the self-reflexivity necessary to grapple with the moral and ethical qualms of undercover work, and yet others, as in the case of the Black investigators the Committee of 14 hired to suss out vice and prostitution in 1920s Harlem, may simply believe in the moralizing mission and therefore find no qualms at all about the work. 
When the authorized crime is sexual in nature, the complications are amplified. According to Gary Marks, 21st century police departments still assign officers to police consensual sexual behavior. Officers often find it, quote, undignified, unchallenging, demeaning, and socially unproductive. Such assignments are often given goofy nicknames like Fruit Shakes and Pussy Posse. As one officer who was tasked with us arresting nude male exotic dancers put it, quote, I hate to think that's my job in life, to go around telling guys to cover their buns and girls that they can't get their t-shirts wet. In cities concerned with policing sex work, women officers often get ordered to pose as prostitutes to entrap men looking to buy sex or gather information on local pimps. When discussing her frustration at being assigned to this work, a Detroit officer said, quote, I went to Michigan State University and I studied hard to be a policewoman, but I don't think all the training was done so that I could pose as a prostitute. For much of the 20th century, I should actually say that Gary Marx's book is actually really old. I think it's from the 70s. So maybe this is not really 20, 21st century. It's all 20th century. But anyway, for much of the 20th century, the sale of pornography, contraceptives, procurement of abortions, and sex between men was illegal in the US, UK, and Ireland. And it fell to law enforcement agencies to enforce those laws accordingly. As uh, as Murphy, uh, Brendan Murphy noted, because sex related crimes tended to be committed in private or in concealed ways, oftentimes undercover agents are the best source of information. When the crime is the sex act itself, though, the role of the undercover agent then can be tricky. How does one secure a body of evidence for a sex crime if it is the act itself that is the crime? Between 1930 and 1967 in the UK, the preferred method of detection was simply surveillance of popular public sex spots. Similar methods were preferred in most US states well into the 1980s and longer in some states. Federal ab abolition of the sodomy laws was not established until 2003 here. In Ireland, where same-sex sex was illegal until 1993, surveillance of popular public sex spots was most commonly employed after 1935. But as Henry Coughlin demonstrated on October 11th, 1927, police officers could and did also employ their own bodies as sites of criminal activity, thereby creating their own body of evidence. Authorized deception to gather evidence need not always involve the committing of authorized crime. Historian Michael Ray has shown how agents provocateurs were sent into the streets and taverns of 18th century France to insert themselves into the homosexual subculture of Paris, but that didn't necessarily require inciting members of the subculture to sex crimes. Indeed, as William Penniston shows by the Napoleonic period, the sex itself was not necessarily illegal, but the police still saw same-sex desiring men as subversive to social norms and thereby in need of close scrutiny. And yet, in some cases, even though the courts were unlikely to send homosexual men to prison officially, French police in the late 19th century still used entrapment tactics in public lavatories as grounds to harass, interrogate, and arrest French same-sex desiring men. Even in a country where the act itself wasn't strictly uh, necessary for some sort of intervention, it was used, although sparingly, to try and control same-sex sex. Much like the fledgling Irish Free State Civic Guard, the London Metropolitan Police experimented with undercover officers given special orders to suss out same-sex sex offenders. Between 1918 and 1935 in London, plainclothes officers were instructed to infiltrate queer pubs and clubs and bait men into indecent assault in public urinals. This was a very effective policing tactic, but for the assigning officers and the London Met hierarchy, over time it proved to be too much of a moral quandary. Here they were sending their officers into situations where they were expected to fit in with a queer crowd, where they might feel pressured or encouraged to engage in sex acts themselves. Superior officers tried making sure that the men who went undercover didn't stay in that job too long or get reassigned to it too often, but by the 1930s this was untenable. The unit in charge of infiltrating gay clubs and the sort of queer subculture was dissolved by 1935. 
In World War II Germany, a soldier who had just returned from the Russian front and cruised a public lavatory in Breslau brushed against the man he thought was interested. The man turned out to be an SS sergeant. When the soldier said, all I did was brush up against you, the officer replied, the fact that you're in here is sufficient proof. In this case, we don't know if the SS officer was there waiting for men to make a pass at him. And based on the SS officer's response and the rate at which Nazis arrested and imprisoned men suspected of homosexuality, it's just as likely that he was planted there purposely. I've been thinking about these sting operations for a while. I think the most interesting cases are those in which the police use their own bodies to bait same-sex desiring men into committing crimes of gross indecency, like those in late 19th century France um, and er, early 20th century uh Britain. Because, of course, then the officers themselves are also committing acts of gross indecency. After all, it takes two to tango. Right. Or in right, most right. of these cases, to fellatio. <laughs> Bazinga. Um, but there are also a number of historical examples of officers using third parties to set up these things, which bear their own ethical challenges. In his work on late 19th century Canada, Lyle Dick discusses a Western Canadian detective who convinced one same-sex desiring man to lure another into a compromising situation. In that case, case the police were the architects of the trap um, using another man whom they'd already caught engaging in same-sex sex to catch their next suspect hmm. it, probably to get a deal mm -hmm. yeah notably in these historic cases officers who used their own bodies as bait and then evidence were always deemed problematic at most police departments employed these baiting tactics for a few years in a row with varying results in the UK, laws were passed throughout the 19th and 20th centuries in response to police who incited civilians to commit crimes. According to Murphy, incitement to commit a crime was a felony at common law, while the activities of the agent provocateur were specifically rejected as a law enforcement technique in a number of parliamentary inquiries between 1833 and 1980. The recognition that this baiting technique was too close to incitement for comfort undoubtedly contributed to its discontinuation in the UK. If nothing else, the UK example reveals the shifting nature and revisability of police organizations. What might be authorized crime or deception in one period may be rejected as incitement of crime or entrapment in another. In 1924, the newly formed Irish Free State created the Civic Guard. It was intended to be a police force for the people, distinct from the former Royal Irish Constabulary. From their beginning in the early 19th century, the RIC, Royal Irish Constabulary, was a tool of colonial control, aiding British soldiers in crushing Irish rebellions, following orders to evict rural tenant farmer families from their homes, and enforcing the laws disenfranchising Irish men and women passed by Parliament in London. Independent Ireland's Garda was supposed to be different. In 1925, District Justice Kenneth Redden said, quote, that he wanted it understood that the days when a police officer might treat an ordinary citizen as an inferior animal had definitely ceased. The police were paid and kept and run by the people, and they were servants of the people. And in some important ways, they were different. The first recruits for the new force were drawn from those Irishmen who'd fought for independence. They were given new uniforms, and significantly, they were established as an unarmed force. The Royal Irish Constabulary was tasked with keeping the Irish citizenry in line. Policing was often brutal, aligned with external pressure to maintain Ireland's continuance in the United Kingdom. Little effort was funneled into policing sex unless crimes were specifically reported to the constables. When it came to policing same-sex sex crimes, investigations were limited to those of adults sexually assaulting children under the age of 12. Sex did not destabilize English rule of Ireland, and so policing it was not an important focus of the RIC. Conversely, sexual morality had been a key tool of Irish nationalism since the 19th century, when Irish members of Parliament used same-sex sex scandal and English crime to challenge England's moral authority to rule Ireland. 
Irish nationalist newspapers insisted that gross indecency was, quote, the last crime an Irishman was likely to be guilty of, and politicians paraded around crime statistics that often showed more sex crimes across the spectrum in London alone than in all of Ireland for any given year. In the 20th century, when Irish nationalism was slowly fused with Catholicism, Ireland's self-governance rested on its purity. Sex could very well destabilize Irish rule of Ireland. Under the leadership of Owen O'Duffy, the first commissioner of the National Police Force, the Garda dedicated considerable resources to policing sex. They drove street-walking sex workers underground, and for the first time in Irish history, conducted extensive campaigns to seek out and arrest men having sex with other men. In Dublin, from 1900 to 1920, only 18 men were arrested for same-sex sex crimes. During O'Duffy's term as Garda Commissioner from 1924 to 1931, 145 men were prosecuted for gross indecency or sodomy. In O'Duffy's last year in the position of commissioner, three of his officers entrapped gross indecency offenders with their own bodies. As suggested by the activities of D.O. Henry Coughlin, O'Duffy's officers used any means necessary to detect and arrest gross indecency offenders. Irish entrapment operations often involved several arranged meetings with a suspect after a guard displayed the signals and body language of a sexual invitation, an elbow rub at the urinal or the display of an erect penis, and even the committal of quote-unquote acts of gross indecency by the guards themselves. There were 10 cases from 1927 to 36 in which a guard was the bait in the trap. Only half resulted in guilty verdicts, with two cases being thrown out entirely in 1933 and 36 because the judge refused to prosecute. Judges and juries did not always feel comfortable with the idea that the guards were themselves involved in the crime committed. Like the debates that significantly reduced the London Met's reliance on baiting homosexual offenders in the 1920s, the moral danger that these tactics created were too high a price to pay. Detective Officer Henry Coughlin was instructed by a superior officer, Ennis, to dress in plain clothes while on duty and patrol O'Connell Street on foot, seeking out individuals who may have been committing crimes. We don't have a record of the exact orders Ennis gave, or if Coughlin was instructed to haunt specific locations, like public lavatories, to catch specific kinds of criminal activity, such as indecent exposure or acts of gross indecency, in other words, sex between men. But according to Coughlin, he reported his conversation with the man from the lab to his superior officer and was given special instructions to follow through with the meeting on October 11th, where they met the content of their first conversation and even their parting words would all have suggested to both Coughlin and Ennis that this man from the lab was seeking a sexual encounter. I think it's safe to read this case as one in which Coughlin was walking the beat in plain clothes in 1927, looking for potential gross indecency offenders in Dublin's public labs. While this may have been the end of an experimental period in U.S. and U.K. policing history, giving way to more formalized, institutionalized, and regulated periods of investigative policing behavior, in 1927, the Irish police force was itself only three years old. This new police force was also charged with overseeing the enforcement of independent Ireland's values. As we discussed in our episode on the Dublin Castle scandal, that included a pretty strict code of sexual morality. The Guardi harassed sex workers until they were forced out the streets. Unwed mothers were forced to give up their babies, and women even suspected of having sexual thoughts were imprisoned arbitrarily in Magdalene laundries. Books and newspapers were heavily censored. Any mention of women who practice any kind of family limitation or of same-sex desire were put on the banned book list and prevented from circulating by mail. And of course, men who sought sex with other men were watched, waited for, and entrapped, and then sent off for up to two years imprisonment with hard labor. Henry Coughlin met with the man he met in the lab, as arranged, on October 11th. Surprised that Coughlin had actually showed up, the man from the lab said, It's funny how one face knows another. When Coughlin asked where they ought to go, the other man assured him that he knew of a good place at the back of the bank on Fleet Street, and they walked there together. 
As they walked, the man told Coughlin of other good places around Dublin and of other men he'd gone with, presumably to those good places. When they arrived at The Good Place, a public lavatory on Fleet Street, the man unbuttoned Coughlin's vest and pants and gave Coughlin's penis a squeeze. The man pulled Coughlin close, caressed him, and then took off his own trousers and revealed his penis, saying, isn't that a fine big one? That may give you a horn. Look at that. (laughs) (laughs) Coughlin did look, but then he stepped back, trousers still open, and told the man he was under arrest. What's most shocking to me is the guard's <laughs> commitment to the ruse, right? Right remember, right? remember that SS officer in Germany in the 1940s who arrested a man for simply brushing shoulders with him in a public urinal. Um, now, granted, 1927 Ireland was not 1942 Germany for many, many reasons. But the homophobia and nationalist vigor that drove ordinary policemen like Coughlin and that SS officer were not all that different. And perhaps not unrelatedly, um, but a little bit unrelatedly, Commissioner <laughs> Owen O'Duffy, who trained the men like you know Coughlin, was a bit of a fascist himself. Um, after he was booted out of the commissioner gig, he formed his own little like blue shirt group, like the Italian black shirts and the German brown shirts. Wow. Yeah, which ostensibly patrolled outside of Dublin Castle to protect, quote unquote, free speech or Ooh, some yikes. nonsense, but was really just a show of force to let um, Eamon de Valera, who was then the, the prime minister, know that O'Duffy was not without his own resources. Oh, my. Um, but that's a digression. Sorry. So still... The definition of gross indecency in Ireland was as vague as the day the British made the law in 1885 and really could have been interpreted um, as making a sexual pass in a public laboratory, like, you know, a brushing of a shoulder um, with the right judge and jury. But Coughlin, and here's one of those sentences that I didn't finish. Ah! (laughs) (laughs) He didn't Um, leave it up to chance. No, Coughlin did not leave it up to chance. He created a body of evidence with his own physical form, right? His penis, his, he was the one being caressed by this man. And he looked at that displayed other man's penis, right? In much the same way that any normal sexual encounter between two men in a public laboratory might take place. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a sense, guards like Coughlin put their bodies at risk, if not legally, then certainly morally. These were not deep undercover operatives infiltrating gangs or corrupt organizations where they might be asked to commit crimes in order to be accepted long enough to amass evidence. These were plainclothes officers instructed to walk the beat and root out gross indecency offenders. It's difficult to even compare them to plainclothes guards who might catch a drug dealer by purchasing drugs. A more apt comparison would be if the officer bought the drugs, took the drugs to make sure that they were drugs, and then arrested the drug dealer. Officers who baited same-sex desiring men into committing crimes thrust their own bodies into the sting. In a country founded on Catholic nationalist ideals and in a police force made up of 95% Catholic men, these tactics most certainly compromised the officers involved. More importantly, though, the admission of participation in these acts had the potential to undermine the authority of the guard. When giving his testimony, Detective Officer Coughlin was questioned extensively about the details of the events that led to the man in the lab's arrest. The defense attorney asked about their conversation the first night, whether Coughlin knew that the defendant was ill and whether he led the defendant on with questions such as, where will we go? And at the back of the building, we will pick up boys for a few pence. Coughlin was also asked if he put his arm around Bodkin's, uh, the, the man in the lab's waist, whether he offered anal sex, and whether he was the one to suggest that the man in the lab open his trousers and take out his penis. All implications that he, of course, denied, but which may have registered doubt in the minds of the judge and jury. By the standards of the time, Coughlin's tactics were extreme and seemed an opening for the prosecution to find fault with the evidence of his testimony. Notably, the judge in the case, Kerr Davitt, um, who was typically notoriously harsh in his dealings with gross indecency offenders, permitted this defendant, the man in the lab, to pay 25 pounds instead of serving his 12 months with hard labor sentence, um, which suggests, I mean, they had to convict him because he 
gave you know he he admitted he <laughs> he admitted to the crime himself the man in the lab did, lab right. did. um but clearly there was some unease here mm-hmm Coughlin was the first recorded detective to use those tactics, but he was not the last. In the 10 entrapment cases, there were nine guards who were instructed to or chose to employ their bodies as sexual bait for gross indecency and offenses. D.O. Michael Kern was the only officer who entrapped men twice in Irish history. It was a dangerous game to play, and as suggested in the long-term judicial outcomes, not particularly effective. There's not much in the Irish court records to suggest that lawyers argued entrapment as a legal defense, but the judge and jury's unease with these cases seems to suggest a recognition of the moral and ethical concerns surrounding the cases. And those are uneasinesses that undoubtedly cross the minds of judges and juries in many of the cases involving authorized deception and authorized crime. I sort of envy the scholars of modern police who get to interview the women who go undercover as sex workers or men assigned to arresting nude male exotic dancers because we can get a sense of how they feel about being assigned to the morality squads. In my academic writing, I'm trying to pick apart the testimonies of these guards that are in these old, dirty, falling apart court records to get a sense of their motivations. Did they do it because they were believers in the cause? Did they do it because they were just following orders? Did they do it because they had a personal and sexual interest in that kind of work? I don't know. I hope to someday stumble on Henry Coughlin or Michael Kern's personal papers or reports to get a better look at their motivations. What we might conclude with here, though, is a consideration of what is right and wrong in modern policing like Coughlin and Kern cruising for men who might make a sexual advance on them. Our current policing system devotes a lot of resources to crime prevention through investigation and intelligence gathering. I know that most criminal justice reformers would argue that prevention needs to be affected outside the police organization through social programming, education, investment in children, affordable housing, etc. We need to treat the root of crime, inequity, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Like the London and Dublin Metropolitan Policing Organizations that decided using officers as sexual bait was morally and ethically problematic as a tactic, perhaps it's time for our contemporary policing organizations to re-examine the widespread use of authorized deception and authorized crime. Policing studies show the negative effects uh, authorized deception has on officers. So are these practices the most effective use of our resources? As demonstrated by the Irish and British cases, I think it's always useful to be self-reflexive, to ask questions, and to demand reform where there are clear ethical problems with the status quo. I mean, I think one thing that that sort of occurs to me, I I mentioned um, in the middle about how we know that police today, yeah, they're not supposed to run their lights so that they can speed when there isn't a legitimate reason, but we know that they do. Um, And my dad worked in law enforcement, so he had like a special disdain for police officers who took themselves too seriously in this way. And I think that um, one thing that kind of <laughs> occurs to me in, in Coughlin's example or, or any of these Irish men who, who kind of took it upon themselves to go this far, to me, it almost seems like guys who were like just taking their taking the, the task too seriously. Does that make sense? Like they were mm-hmm. kind of like... Um, I mean, power hungry is almost too simple a phrase, a way of putting it, but, you know, kind of getting off on the power that they had over other people. And I think a significant amount of policing has to do with that. You know, it's not just about like justice, but it's also becomes about like individual people and their ability to feel powerful. Right. There's almost like a vigilante justice but it's within the authorized justice system right yeah it's like a oh i'm 
I'm Batman, but I'm exactly also the other guy, the whatever, the police commissioner. Yeah, Gordon. yeah. Th- this is um, we had a conversation about this sort of same theme in terms of the military um, in one of my classes recently, because um, in both sort of veteran circles, but also now, I think, in police circles as well, in that like thin blue line sort of community, there is a lot of punisher iconography that police will put onto their cars or onto their uniforms somehow patches that they will wear um and and that's exactly it's it's a vigilante justice thing right it's like a it's me you know against the world of crime and it's dangerous out there and that you need a um rogue like me to protect you right which is Mm -hmm. not how the police or the military are supposed to function, right? right? And that kind of mentality is what I think, at least in some sense, not not maybe the entire um, explanation, but that that mentality is what leads to abuses of police power. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned Batman, and, and that's I think that that's more accurate than I mean it's kind of like a joking thing, but I think that it's it's actually pretty accurate. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it's it's like a psychological phenomenon that I think is in part because of the way that we frame police as an organization, policing as a, as a concept in America and, you know, a lot of other places too, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's essentially good versus evil yeah. kind of mentality mm-hmm. and that creates this dichotomy of where the civilians are the potential enemies Mm -hmm. and you are a soldier in a battlefield and you have to have like this close knit, protect each other kind of sentimentality within the unit. And Mm -hmm. that is, if, if it's truly an organization that's supposed to serve, that's supposed to be the, a police force for the people as in the Irish case, then that can't be the way that you approach. Right. And I think um, there's, there's, I know that there's some criminal justice, criminal criminology and and policing scholarship that argues that part of this is um, facilitated because we've, um, we have this over-reliance on technology, especially like cars, right? Because when you're walking a beat, right? When you're actually walking through your neighborhoods and you you know the people in your neighborhood right. and you get yeah. to know them yeah. mm-hmm. and you're not separated by this giant metal death machine that might have armored plating or whatever. Mm-hmm. Your Batmobile. Your Batmobile, <laughs> right? Then you're, you have a different relationship with your community. Right. Whereas now we rely so heavily on police cars because... That you know, there's just too much area to cover, right. or um, you, you want to have faster response times for emergencies. But um, it really makes the community versus it creates a versus situation. Definitely, um, yeah. That that makes me think this is kind of a, a silly, a silly thing to think about. But um, you know, when when I was little anyway, like you were watching like, I don't know, Sesame Street or any of those things, um, they would always say like, if something happens, like, go tell your local police officer, like, go tell the police officer on the street. Who? And I was like, what? What, what police, police officer, officer on, on my street? street? Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, you might you might see them but it was always like okay the only police officers in my town were like the state troopers and that was only because their barracks happened to be located in in our town right not our town but the next town over um and so there is sort of a um we have this kind of like mayberry vision in our minds that there are these like good country sort of cops out there like walking around in our neighborhoods you know just ready to answer your questions and help you along or whatever and that's really not accurate as right. you point out right like there's a, a disconnect from local communities that these people police and i know that there's some police um organizations are working to to change that and and mm-hmm. have different you know programs to try to change that but um I wonder, though, too, if there's a way in which now the the police officer that if I was a kid today that I would go to would probably be a school resource officer now, right? Because there's mm-hmm. so many police in schools. Right. So maybe yeah. that's 
I don't know. That's a good and bad thing. It's also a whole different can of worms. Yeah, that's a different kind of conversation. Yeah. The need for place in schools and mm-hmm. children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that yeah. the this sort of like zealous um, pursuit of, of crime, creating the crime that you then get to bust, right? Right. Right. does go hand in hand with the excessive use of force mm-hmm. because it's about power and control, mm-hmm. right? And, like, again, my dad always used to complain. This was, like, one of his, like, standard, like, when my dad would vent about things, like, he had, like, a standard list of things that, like, okay, now we're getting the this vent, right? And one of them was about how he always had to work with police officers or um, conservation officers who... um were obsessed with being able to like take down a bad guy physically right <laughs> yeah. so they were always like doing these ridiculous trainings and and his his phrase was always so that we can learn how to kill people with our thumbs mm. and i think that that's really part like when you yeah. when you're being trained with that kind of stuff right now yeah. if you have the if you've learned how to kill someone with your thumb eh, like the temptation is there to like use that skill now right right yeah absolutely so things to think about yeah yeah Yeah. definitely um i'm glad i got to do this episode because i i needed to be thinking about this stuff for either my book or at least my next article yeah absolutely um and in fact it's stuff that I sort of have to start thinking about as well, just kind of history of policing and, and history mm-hmm. of crime too. So, um, and of course all of this stuff is as, as you've said several times, really relevant to, right. You know, issues that we're having today with, with policing and, and a reminder that it's not as though we, like a lot of people try to make this into like, it's a modern bad apple situation. It's like, no, this is baked in, Mm-hmm. the history of policing yeah. this is how we have built this system so if there's going to be change it can't be removing the bad apples it has to be systemic yes yes on that note thanks for listening <laughs> make sure that you follow us on facebook and twitter we are at underscore uh, no we are at dig underscore history not at underscore at dig underscore history if you're looking to bedazzle yourself with epic dig swag we have amazing designs um that all were designed by averil um you can find those at our t public store um you can find the link to that store as well as transcripts and bibliographies for all of our episodes at digpodcast.org um we also don't forget have a um, page on our website that's dedicated to educator resources and we are actively trying to get your input if you are a teacher who uses our episodes in any capacity please get in touch um, and let us know how you're using it and what kind of resources would be useful to you if we were to create more in the future all right okay bye bye this podcast was produced by the historians of dig elizabeth garner Mazurik, sarah hanley cousins marissa rhodes and me Avril earls thanks for listening and those are, and those are uneasiness, uneasinesses. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In any criminal situation, and oh god, now I have to say this: a uh, agent's provocateur. No, just say agent provo- provocateur. Okay. Famously, John Livingstone, an FBI undercover agent who was lauded for his successful investigate. That's not a sentence. Much like the fledgling... (laughs) My mouth, like, failed. Okay. If nothing else, the UK example reveals... If nothing else, the UK... Oh my god. When officers commit unauthorized crimes, there are instances... Uh, the, the man in the lab's... Waste. Um... Oh. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god that was a tongue twister of a sentence maggie in oregon 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 or oregon oregon i say oregon okay it, seemed, it sounded wrong 
the Oregon Trail, Oregon Trail. I always Ugh. said, when I was growing up, I always said Oregon. And I think it's because it was Oregon Trail. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 